Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and as the chairman of the British Kazakh Society, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you all to this important BKS webinar, which is on uh, military cooperation between our two countries, and specifically Kazakhstan's military reform and peacekeeping am ambitions. As you all know, the British Kazakh Society aims to promote the very best of relations between Britain and Kazakhstan, including highlighting trade, investment opportunities, as well as promoting high level cooperation between government, finance and industry. We really act as a conduit uh, and place a strong emphasis on promoting international affairs, as well as defence and diplomatic issues. So this webinar is very much uh, firmly within our remit. Um, this year, as you all know, represents an historic milestone for Kazakhstan marking the 30th anniversary of independence. The transformation of the country has really been quite extraordinary and the military system has undergone significant change and modernization as well, as we'll hear later. The military relationship between our two countries is extremely strong and our very distinguished speakers today who come from both the UK and Kazakhstan have very special insight into this military cooperation. Uh, I will ask them to uh, speak in turn, and they've in, uh, also kindly agreed to answer questions at the end. Um, I also would note that we have simultaneous uh, language translation as we go. So our first speaker, and I'm delighted to welcome him, is His Excellency Erlan Idrisov, who's the Distinguished Ambassador for Kazakhstan. As you all know, he has served twice as Foreign Minister and has been a strong advocate for Kazakhstan on the world stage. And he will make a brief introduction. Uh, Erlan, over to you. Uh, Rupert, thank you very much. Once again, good morning to everyone. Uh, Lord Astor, uh, my general, Bob Stewart. I, I, uh, you know that I call him my general. And let <laughs> me use this opportunity to congratulate him because he was recently uh, honored to become a member of the Privy Council uh, and he was elected to the uh, uh, Intelligence Committee. So we now he properly have to address him right, the right Honorable uh, Bob Stewart. So I welcome uh, my general uh, to this uh, new position, but I hope that you will remain as close friends in this new capacity as before. And of course, I'd like to welcome our uh, Kazakh audience and other attendees. Uh, uh, I thank you once uh, again, Rupert, you and uh, all our friends in the British Kazakh Society, we have an exciting year and uh, it is uh, quite exemplary that uh, the British Kazakh Society stands out in uh, marking the 30th anniversary of Kazakhstan independence. Uh, this is, I think, is our fifth or sixth event on the Kazakhstan at 30 series and it is dedicated to one important aspect of uh, life uh, of uh, uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, I uh, should tell you briefly that uh, 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 Kazakhstan uh, uh, has its own clear-cut uh, uh, vision uh, how to build its uh, defense capability. Of course, uh, Kazakhstan uh, never was and never going to be an aggressive country and our uh, defense policy is called defense policy. So uh, everything we do is to make sure that we protect our sovereignty, we protect our territorial integrity from any unexpected developments. Of course, we do not believe that uh, the world will go into the calamities of the last uh, century, uh, of the past century, I hope. Uh, even uh, uh, when we see today that uh, relations between uh, global powers are not uh, the best, but we hope that reasoning will prevail. And Kazakhstan as a small country uh, by population, but uh, quite visible country in the heart of Eurasia, wants to be a model and example uh, how to make peace. Uh, and uh, uh, normal uh, relations with uh, uh, all your neighbors and uh, beyond. Kazakhstan's defense policy is uh, peaceful by its nature. We cannot afford, of course, uh, being a small nation, we cannot afford uh, having a big army uh, of uh, hundreds of thousands to millions of people. Uh, our uh, uh, founding president uh, has formulated a very clear-cut uh, uh, vision for our uh, military and defense policy, we have to build uh, and sustain, uh, first of all, uh, a capable, uh, professional, well-equipped, well-trained, uh, compact, modern army. 
I think in these simple words, uh, you, uh, they cover everything you want to build and have in Kazakhstan. Uh, we have a huge territory to defend, to protect, to watch. Uh, the perimeter of our border is exceeding, if you take the Caspian Sea, is exceeding 15,000 kilometers. Uh, and of course, uh, we are not uh, uh, going out of our mind to uh, provide uh, a soldier or uh, a frontier guard on each and every kilometer of our borders. It is senseless, it is pointless. Therefore, we make focus on uh, uh, modernity, uh, modern equipment, uh, and advanced training of our military, uh, and uh, the professional basis of our army. Uh, our uh, military colleagues will tell you more, uh, but let me tell you that uh, uh, we have uh, been quite successful in doing this, and we partner, our partnership uh, in military and defense cooperation is uh, geographically uh, broader than one would suspect. We do not limit ourselves only to uh, the Eurasian space. Uh, we go broader. We have excellent relations, military and defense relations with our European partners, with our Asian partners, with the United States of America, and uh, with the United Kingdom. Uh, it has a history. Actually, the history of our defense cooperation goes back to the uh, uh, history of our diplomatic relations. It is almost 30 years. On an annual basis, we have bilateral uh, bilateral military plans of cooperation. They focus on three main areas. One, uh, of course, is military training. Uh, second is uh, uh, peacekeeping uh, and uh, uh, language training. Peacekeeping stands out because Kazakhstan being uh, not the most populous country in the world, but still wants to contribute to global efforts to bring peace and stability. Therefore, we are part of the UN exercise uh, to bring peace to different uh, troubling parts in the world. Therefore, we have uh, uh, put ourselves in the realm of the United Nations under the peacekeeping umbrella. Therefore, I'd like uh, to once again thank all of you uh, uh, for being with us today uh, to hear what we do together with UK and domestically in terms of uh, our defense uh, capability building. And I thank all our British uh, military friends and defense friends uh, for being with us. And uh, I hope that uh, this uh, very benign defense cooperation will uh, bear fruits for the future. I thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much indeed for that um, excellent introduction. And it brings me on to our um, first keynote speaker, who is the Right Honourable Lord Astor of Hever, who's a distinguished member of the House of Lords. Uh, he was member, he was Minister of Defence uh, between 2010 and 2015, and is also served as the Prime Minister's Trade Envoy for Kazakhstan. He served in the British Army and the Lifeguards, which is part of the Household Cavalry, between 1966 and 1970. He's currently the Defence Secretary's Special Advisor for Military Cooperation with the Sultanate of Oman and is the PM's Trade Envoy for Oman, as, as well as being a member of the Chairman's Advisory Group of the British Kazakh Society. Uh, Lord Astor, the floor is yours. Rupert, thank you very much for that introduction. And, and as a, a member of the uh, Chairman's Advisory Group, I am delighted to support the excellent work of the BKS and participate in this webinar on military cooperation between our two countries. The BKS is making a really vital contribution to promoting and enhancing the bilateral relationship. And I really welcome this webinar on military issues given my, as Rupert said, my earlier career in the, in the British Army. And I do want to record my congratulations to the board of BKS under the chairmanship of Rupert Goodman and the staff for the extraordinary transformation and expansion of the society's activities over the recent years. This series of high-level BKS webinars is doing so much to highlight understanding and cooperation in trade, investment, culture, diplomacy and international affairs, and now of course, defense. And I have a particular interest in Kazakhstan, having been the Prime Minister Trade Envoy there, and I am currently a member of the all party parliamentary group for Kazakhstan, so ably chaired by, um, by the Right Honourable the Colonel. The group was first registered in 2015 with the objective of developing interparliamentary dialogue 
and increasing parliamentary knowledge about Kazakhstan. And I'm delighted that Bob is speaking today. The all party parliamentary group covers all areas of the bilateral relationship, including foreign affairs, trade and investment, science and education, intelligence and security, as well as defense policy. Kazakhstan has a, a distinguished military history. The Kazakh army launched when the Soviet 32nd Army came under Kazakh government control in 1992. And today, the Kazakh army has modernized and transformed across all areas, including structure, training, and materials. And they should be congratulated. And I was particularly interested, um, Your Excellency, in your background description and in, in your um, short speech. Kazakhstan's major role in international peacekeeping is much welcomed. And Kazakhstan has one of the largest peacekeeping forces to have emerged from the former Soviet Union. There is an important history of UK-Kazakhstan uh, military cooperation with exercise Step Eagle, a key component. Uh, this exercise has helped develop a Kazakh force capable of deploying on UK mandated peace support operations. The B this BKS webinar on defense cooperation is very important. And I add my welcome to the other speakers, uh, including His Excellency Ambassador. So thank you very much. Lord Astor, thank you very much indeed for um, uh, setting the scene so eloquently. Um, and I now call on our next speaker, um, who um, the ambassador mentioned, um, the Right Honourable Colonel Bob Stewart, DSO MP. Uh, Bob is a very distinguished soldier and politician. His military career has spanned both Northern Ireland and Bosnia, and he received uh, the DSO um, in 1993. His last post was as Chief of Policy at Supreme Court as Allied Powers Europe. He was elected MP for Beckenham, and as uh, the Ambassador has mentioned, uh, among his other appointments, is, cu is currently a member of the Intelligence and Security Committee and the National Strategy Joint Committee. Uh, he is also, um, as Lord Astor mentioned, Chairman of the APBG for Kazakhstan. Uh, Bob, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Rupert. Well, can I just endorse exactly what my very good friend, Lord Johnny Astor, has said about the BKS. It is a fabulous organisation and I'm really pleased to be associated with it. We sometimes meet for tea. Well, not really, but we're meant to be meeting for tea shortly. Um, I think Johnny Astor is a great guy. He has got a huge amount of experience, both as a minister and as a soldier um, as well. So, um, you know, and I think he, Johnny, you were the first person to give me a, a bollocking, if I can use a soldier's expression, when I very rudely um, was looking at my iPhone when you were talking and you got hold of me afterwards and gave me a good rifting. I wonder if you could remember that. And I took it because you were right. And there's one thing about soldiers, uh, the two colonels present, the one thing we're good at is we know when we're in the wrong and we get shit. And we, I got shit from my very good friend, Lord Astor, and it taught me a good lesson. Um, delighted to be here to see um, Ambassador Erlan here, who is a really good friend, and Rupert, so are you. So um, I'm going to talk about peacekeeping, really, because that's probably what I have the most to talk about in, in this matter. Now, we've already discovered, and we know that Kazakhstan uh, has assumed a, a real leadership role in supporting United Nations operations. And that's, that's astonishing in the 30 years uh, it's, it's been since its last, um, you know, Kazakhstan didn't start 30 years ago. Kazakhstan has got more history than most of the Brits because we, you know, when, when Kazakhs, Kazakhs were running around ruling the world, we were running around in skins. Um, but, but so um, we, we have got no right to tell Kazakhstan anything, really, because of the civilization we had. But look, just look at the look, just look at the peacekeeping that the Kazakh armed forces have done. They've gone to the Lebanon. 
they went there in August 2020 and they've made a big impact. Um, you, you, Kazakhstan, have sent people to the Western Sahara. It's called Medurso and it had an impact there. And you sent military operations to support the coalition uh, led by the United States in, in, in Iraq, but not just send people, they did things. They did things like, um, well, for example, obviously humanitarian assistance, mine clearing. What clearing mines is probably the most crucial thing peacekeepers can do. Water purification and things like looking after the people. This is something so important. And uh, so I have to say that those three operations alone actually mark a very big tick on the international um, military cooperation chart. But the other thing is, of course, as the colonels will know, you do Step Eagle every year. Uh, Step Eagle is a sort of opera, uh, a exercise, including NATO and other countries but mainly the United States and NATO countries, normally in Kazakhstan, but sometimes not, but normally in Kazakhstan. And this, this is, has a real impact, um, I have to say. I'm gonna come on to that. So this impressive contribution in 30 years has embellished the international reputation of this country called Kazakhstan. In my view, and the ambassador knows this because I've said it before, this next 80 years, actually 78, of the 21st century um, will be the years where Kazakhstan rises up and establishes itself as a leading power in the world. And uh, I think that's terribly important. Now, the next thing for Kazakhstan to achieve in peacekeeping operations is, of course, to be the lead nation. So far, as I read it, they're not lead nation status, Johnny. I don't think they've been lead nation. But when, as a, I want to see, to be honest, I want to see Kazakhstan on the Security Council as a permanent member in this century, because actually, They've got a really good right to do it. But equally, I want to see Kazakhstan, when the Security Council meets or the, um, the decision is made on peacekeeping or peacemaking, that one of the countries in the world that the Security Council turns to is not just the United States, not just the UK, France, Canada, but Kazakhstan to lead. And what we want to see, what I'd like to see, is a Kazakh general, admiral or air marshal, running the operation, running a peacekeeping operation. That's what something I would like to see. Um, and I think that is important because not just, it's not just important for international military reputation, it's important for the international reputation of Kazakhstan which has already played its full part in trying to do, you know, helping, the, you know, people withdraw from Afghanistan, helping with peace conferences. Now, I'm, I really just want to say a few things that I have learned in my experience uh, as a colonel, colonels, um, when I was, in, I mean, um, Rupert's kindly mentioned that I had a lot of experience in Northern Ireland. Well, that's true. I had seven operational tours of six months long in Northern Ireland. I have lost a lot of men, if that's, a, if that's something to be proud of. It's not, but I have lost a lot of men uh, in Northern Ireland. And um, so my background is, you know, seven, six month tours in Northern Ireland. And then, in 1992, seems one heck of a long time ago, same time as really uh, Kazakhstan parted from the Soviet Union. 
um, I was appointed to take uh, the British uh, contingent into Bosnia as the UN British United Nations commander. And so I commanded the first group. And I have to tell you, anyone listening, that this was totally different to anything I'd learned before. This was not, I, I went to Sandhurst, and by the way, I'm delighted that there are uh, three Kazakh officer cadets have been there and two other officers have attended the army, uh, British Army Command Staff course. Delighted that that's happening because that is important. But when I went to Bosnia, I knew nothing. And can I be absolutely honest, I was told in the Ministry of Defence that um, I asked, what is my mission? Now, the colonels will understand this, as Johnny and, and everyone will understand this, that the military require a mission. And I, 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 I said in the Ministry of Defence, what's, what's my mission? What do you want me to achieve? It was a Sunday, by the way, when I was told that. It was 10 o'clock and there were all these people, all these civil servants and, and generals and admirals looking down at me. I was a lieutenant colonel. And I said, um, what do you want me to do? And they said, we don't know. Go and see the prime minister. Tomorrow. So I've never, ever been into 10 Downing Street. And I went with some hesitation down 10 Downing Street to the door and went in and saw the Prime Minister. I saw John Major, who was the Prime Minister. And I said to him, sir, what, what's my mission? What do you want me to do? And he said, can you do a good job? Well, we, we that have been in the military uh, know that that's not quite the answer I expected. But what it does lead on to is my first point, that we had to be, or I had to be, incredibly flexible. It was very different to what I'd been before, what I'd seen before, what my experience was. Um, and the general that sent me, um, who was a good friend actually, he said, I said, well, why have I been selected to do this? And he said, well, you don't necessarily think like um, a staff college. You think in a different way. Well, he'd been my boss in the Ministry of Defence and, and um, you know, he, he, he was a, he went on to be Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Europe. And he, I said, well, what do you mean I don't think in a different way? And he said to me, Bob, this will either ruin your career or create it. Guess what? It ruined it. <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter was, what he was saying was I had to be hardworking. He knew that. But I had to be very flexible. And definitely. I had to make decisions. And that is what I learned very fast, uh, that I would have to make the decisions because when I was on the ground, of course it's different now, but when I was on the ground in Bosnia, it took me two hours to get through to any person above me. So I was really on my own. And um, I couldn't even speak to the United Nations um, because the communications were so bad. And when I did get on, I used to get um, contact from when people could speak to me, I would have to answer to so many people. That's the other thing I learned. It wasn't straight a military chain of command, which is normally straight, taut, taut and short and clear. It wasn't. I once toted up, added up 
how many people I had to answer for. I'll just give you a few, few answers. The Prince of Wales would ring me, the Prime Minister, the Foreign Secretary, the Defence Secretary, Archie Hamilton, the Minister. That's five, and these are just the, the top. And then I had the military, then I had the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, then I had the International Committee of the Red Cross. By the time I'd finished toting up, I had over 10 people who were demanding or expecting me to do things, and often they were very different. So it's a very difficult thing, and a judgment had to be made all the time. Sometimes I got it right, and sometimes I got it wrong. Let me give you an example. I worked under General Philip Morion. He was a soldier, a French foreign legionnaire general. Great guy. And he came to me one day and he said, um, you know, I want you to go. Can you go to Srebrenica? I said, well, General, um, it's well outside my area. It's, you know, it will take me two days to get there. And the British have not allowed me to move outside my area. So he said, well, I'm telling you, I want you to move outside your area. And I said, OK. So I went back to the Ministry of Defence and I said, the general wants me to move outside my area. Can I do it? He said, and do you know what the answer came back is to show how difficult it was? The answer came back, if you do that, it's on your own head. All right. Now, that happened. We went in. We did take two days to get there. When we got there, about 20 people were killed around us. And a few of my soldiers were wounded. But we got there and everyone was delighted that the UN had arrived. This was two years before the massacre of the Bosnian Muslims at Srebrenica. But I assessed that we needed um, helicopters. So I signaled back to London saying, we have seeking helicopters on an aircraft carrier and at split, can I please use seeking helicopters to come in to where I am located to take out women and children who are, who are actually under great threat. I was told, who the hell do you think you are? You're well out of area and you're pushing your luck and you're not going to get them. So I then did something very bad, which is probably why my career was terminated. I then went to the general, Philip Morion, and said, General, the British have said, they will not give me helicopters because it's far too dangerous. But I noticed that we've got a, you've got a squadron of French Pumas on the coast. Any chance we can have French Pumas going in? And I remember the general, he went like this, put his hand on his chest and he said, the honor of France is at stake. Yes. So the next thing that happened is I summoned <coughs> Some of my media representative and said, slip it to the BBC that I have asked for British helicopters and have been told no. I've asked for French helicopters and they are on the way to pick up people who are dying. It went out on the BBC News at six o'clock. And by seven o'clock, I had British helicopters and an end of career, <laughs> as you can imagine. But it was, it, I use that example as why you've got to be flexible. Well, I had to be flexible. So um, each peacekeeping operation is unique. And officers have to be very adaptable. They have to be, they have to lead. I always think of officers on any operation being like conductors. You know, an orchestra. An orche a conductor of an orchestra interprets and makes the music and 
chooses how it's done. And that's how it's how I view an officer's job to make things happen. Soldiers, they're meant to do things much more like a train driver who's got a, a timetable and has got to keep to that timetable and doesn't have much flexibility. But here's my point that as Kazakhstan and as we learn, because the British have to learn too, it's not, we're not experts in peacekeeping, um, and neither is Kazakhstan. We have to learn for each other. Not just the officers, but the soldiers have got to be prepared to make decisions because they're often on their own. In Northern Ireland, in my seven tours there, the officers were generally not in the front line, generally not in the front line. In peacekeeping, officers definitely are in the front line because people, uh, you know, Johnny, Lord Astor's nodding because he totally accepts that, that he's, he's probably done Northern Ireland too, I suspect in his time. Um, and he would agree with me normally in his, his regiment, which is household cavalry, very smart, by the way, it would be, um, you know, um, lots of horses and things like that. But um, my regiment, we didn't know how the back end of a horse from the front end. But we don't say that about Kazakhs, do we, um, Ambassador Ellen? Because, uh, you know, you Kazakhs can ride like the Fury. You can ride across and beat up the whole of Europe with your hordes coming in on your horseback. Beautiful, beautiful riders beautiful riders. Anyway, the, the fact of the matter is, in peacekeeping, um, in my experience, my officers had to be up front. And indeed, I was so pleased, this sounds stupid, that the first person wounded in my battle group was an officer. Because it, what it did was make a signal to the rest of my soldiers as to where the officers were, which was up front. So um, there is a difference, I think. I mean, I used to be a, an intelligence officer, colonels, in, the, in Germany in the long days when the Soviet Union and we were based in Germany um, uh, up until, you know, the war, we were facing the Warsaw Pact as such, which obviously included Kazakhstan. But as an intelligence officer, we were taught that the Soviet group of, so group of Soviet forces, Germany, would come, but their officers would be just largely obeying instructions. They would not be as flexible. We had to be more flexible because, of course, we had far less people. But equally, the Soviet doctrine was much more control. Well, in peacekeeping, I've never known anything where officers have really got to be much more flexible. Um, the Germans have it very well when they talk about mission command. And that's the way the British Army now, I understand, trains it, trains their officers and their soldiers. They're told what they've got to do, what the, the mission is, which I wasn't told by the way, I had to make up my own mission, which was to save lives. It took three months for them to agree that. But from that mission, how they did it was up to them. It's called mission command. And it's the way, I think it's slightly different. I don't know in detail uh, with the Kazakh armed forces, but I suspect Kazakh armed forces are moving that way very fast indeed. And I'm asking the colonels whether they agree, if they can get, do you agree that actually mission command is now taught in the Kazakh armed forces? Yes, nod your head, the colonels I can see. They're nodding, so that's good. Um, I'm very pleased um, that what, well, I've talked about them being, officers being up front um, and, and not expecting that, de that decisions will be made for them. I promised my officers that if they acted 
to the in the best way they could and they made a mistake, I would support them. This is crucially important uh, for me. And uh, sometimes he had a, for example, I remember a BBC journalist or a, uh, a CNN journalist coming say, down at the crossroads down there, there was an, there's an incredibly bad cock up. Cock up is rude, but a very bad um, mistakes being made. Who's responsible for that? And I said, I am responsible for that. So if you're going to report that a mistake's been made, please report that I have made the mistake, not one of my officers. Well, that went down very well with the officers, Rupert. They, they liked that because they knew that they could, you know, the young officers particularly could, could make mistakes and they wouldn't actually be hauled in front as long as they were doing it for good reasons. And I think- um, Bob, this, Bob, you Bob, we, you've um, you've provided a wonderfully comprehensive overview and, and personal anecdotes are tremendous. Um, we need time for questions. And okay, I know people are going to have then, a lot. Rupert. I'll stop there. Um, I'll stop there. That's Strict tremendous. Neutrality very... and fairness. End of. Yeah. Um, if <laughs> the ambassador, when he sends me to Kazakhstan, wants me to go to any place and talk about peacekeeping, you see, I don't have a problem. I shut up now. I really do take direction. I'm a good soldier. And General Rupert Goodman <laughs> and General Lord Astor have told me to shut up. So I shut up. <laughs> Bob, thank you very much indeed. That you, You've you. provided wonderful insights. And I know there'll be a lot of questions for you. So our next speaker is um, Colonel Kasayanov, who is the um, head of the Department of International Cooperation of the Ministry of Defense of the Republic of Kazakhstan, and is a highly decorated officer. Uh, Colonel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, distinguished participants of the webinar, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my honor to present uh, you a short briefing on the development of Kazakhstan Armed Forces. As it was mentioned on December 16th, uh, this year we will celebrate the 30th anniversary of the independence of the Republic of Kazakhstan. And uh, as the head of our State, Kasim Jomar Tokayev said, this is an important milestone in strengthening the revived Kazakh statehood freedom, which our ancestors aspired to. During this time, Kazakhstan has made a rapid way from uh, the owner of the world's fourth nuclear arsenal to the leader of global non-proliferation, -proliferation, closing the world's largest nuclear training range in Semipolitnesk. Also, since the proclamation of independence, uh, by Kazakhstan, the task of ensuring the security and the defense capability of the young sovereign state has become a top priority. Despite the existing problems of that time, the, the lack of legal framework uh, and experience in defense building, ailing economy and other difficulties of the transition period, it was possible in a short time to create one of the most important attributes of a sovereign state uh, its armed forces. The main task of that time was fulfilled to preserve personnel, equipment and weapon, uh, as well as huge material values. The beginning of the formation of the armed forces faced the problem of the lack of the officer cadre, uh, the increased outflow of officers uh, combined with the unstable economic situation of the early 90s led to significant difficulties in uh, filling the military corps. The main efforts of the defense agency in the 90s uh, were focused on maintaining the officer corps left from the Soviet army. At the initial stage, the armed forces were forced to follow the way of accelerated training of the officers commissioned and non-commissioned to fill the need for the personnel, which is comparable, which was comparable to the period uh, during the Great Patriotic War, Second World War. However, thanks to the personal participation of the first president of the Republic of Kazakhstan in solving the most difficult tasks of the defense building, uh, a combat ready military was formed in a uh, comparably short time. The impl implementation of a set of measures for the development of troops today allowed us to speak about the reliable, uh, protection of the country, 
the ability to adequately respond to potential threats and challenges. At the present day, a large number of activities have been carried out that determine the modern appearance of the armed forces. The tri-service structure of the armed forces of the Republic of Kazakhstan was established. Uh, that comprised of the land forces, aid, defense forces, and naval forces. The development of armed forces primarily took into account the real, but real and potential threats to the military security, current state and the global trends in the, the, in the development of methods of uh, armed engagement, uh, weaponry and military equipment. A set of organizational measures was carried out to strengthen the combined arms component of the constant readiness, increase the reconnaissance, uh, combat potential and strengthen the aviation reconnaissance strike components. In order to counter the information psychological and the information technical impact, the information security system is being improved at the moment. Uh, also, the air defense system has been subjected to a detailed revision. By the order of the Supreme Commander in Chief, a new concept for the defense building and the development of the armed forces has been drafted. It defines the main directions for the development of the military. Uh, the implementation of which will increase the defense capability of the state and ensure readiness uh, for the effective actions in the crisis situation. We have also uh, created special operation forces, uh, which had uh, received uh, qualitatively uh, new development. We moved from a command to an operational model uh, of, uh, of its structure. And the corresponding command has been created. A number of special forces unit and psychological warfare types are transferred to the direct subordination uh, of the special operation forces. Taking into account the actualization of emergency threats, emphasis is placed on the development of dual use component military tra transport aviation, medical and engineering equipment, radiation, chemical, and biological protection equipment. Special attention is paid to the ensuring the safe storage of weaponry and ammunition, including the dispersal of ammunition to new storage, storage facilities. For the first time, we have uh, recently conducted a 100% comprehensive inventory uh, of the equipment and ammunition. And we have taken a decisive course to get rid of unused obsolete military equipment. The Ministry of Defense acts as a locomotive for the defense industry enterprises. We have updated and formed additional proposals for the organization of production of vital military products in the country, in total uh, nine directions. We also pay a lot of attention uh, to the development of our military education system. We have uh, three institute, military institutes in Kazakhstan, uh, as well as uh, National Defense University, which carry out scientific researches within the framework of the grant and program specific funding. One of our participants, unfortunately, today, the modern system of international relations is undergoing, is undergoing a complex transformation, the main science of which are a crisis of trust and the increase of conflicts, the derivation of old and the emergence of new security threats. We all are well aware that in the face of modern challenges, the unity of the world based on the principles of individual security is necessary. We strive to further develop friendly, and, uh, friendly relations in the field of defense and security with all of our foreign partners. The implementation of a set of measures for the development of the military Uh, provided us to confidently speak about the reliable protection of the country. Nowadays, armed forces are ready for the joint actions to maintain peace. We witness the activities of our military abroad as a part of uh, joint uh, uh, UN forces in different missions. Currently, the Kazakh peacekeeping contingent is successfully performing its tasks uh, as a part of Indian battalion in Lebanon, 
uh, as well as in, uh, it was mentioned in Western Sahara before we also had the uh, officers participating in the mission in Cote d'Ivoire and Nepal, uh, Georgia in 2008. Uh, we continue to enhance the geography of our participation in peacekeeping. We, uh, we have certain ambitions in uh, enhancing, enhancing uh, our input to the uh, UN peacekeeping within so-called uh, smart pledges. Uh, that means to provide more needed uh, formations and troops and units uh, to the UN forces. I, I believe that uh, soon Colonel uh, Nidmatulin will uh, elaborate more on this subject. Thank you very much. I'll try to be brief. Colonel, th thank you very much indeed. That was a very detailed analysis for which we're extremely grateful. Um, our next uh, speaker is Colonel uh, Nick McToulin, who is Commandant of the Peacekeeping Training Centre of the Ministry of Defence of the Republic of Kazakhstan. And he will be talking on peacekeeping and its importance. Colonel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Colonel, you're, you're on mute, so if you could unmute, please. Thank you. Uh, Colonel, if you could unmute, I think you're still on mute. Thank you. One, two, three. Is good? Perfect. Yeah, loud and clear. Okay. Thank yep. you. I'm sorry. So it's my honor to brief you about the contribution of Kazakhstan to maintain international peace and security. Uh, we have small briefing and uh, since first uh, day of independence, Kazakhstan had been actively supporting international efforts to promote peace and prevent conflict around the world. And participation of Kazakhstan in peacekeeping operations is a significant sign of our commitment. So before we uh, first national contingent had been sent to UN peacekeeping operation. Some regulatory acts had, be, had to be developed in order to provide personnel with relevant so social support package to protect their rights and describe their obligations, as well as define preparation and deployment procedure. So you can see the, all the uh, regulation acts which is, have been developed and signed. And, uh, right now, uh, we're using them. And uh, from historical background, as independent state, Kazakhstan had taken part of in following international operations to maintain peace and security. In 1993, Kazakhstan decided to deploy its unit on Tajik Afghan border as part of the international effort to resolve uh, the conflict. In period from 1993 till 2001, about 10,000 military sol soldiers took part in the mission. And as uh, Right Honorable Colonel Stewart mentioned, 2003 and 2008, in the framework of Operation Iraqi Freedom, Kazakhstan deployed engineer and medical units, more than 2,090 military personnel on rotation basis, uh, participated in stabilization as part of the stabilization forces. 
Our engineers dispose more than 4 million mines and unexploded ordnance, trained more than 500 Iraqi EOD specialists, purified more than 4,000 cubic waters. Our medical personnel provided medical assistance to more than 5,000 local people, mostly children and uh, women. In the 2007 and 2009 special political mission in Nepal, uh, we sent first our uh, military observers. It was first mission for Kazakhstan under the UN umbrella. In the 2008-2009, Kazakhstan also took part of the OECC mission in Georgia. Uh, Colonel Hussein also participated as one of the Colonel, only one in that mission. And from 2015 to 2017, three officers participated in UN mission in Cote d'Ivoire as military observers. Since 2014, 23 officers have participated as military observers in UN mission for referendum in Western Sahara. Today, five officers, including one female, performing their tasks in various positions in mission. Their main task to monitor ceasefire agreements between parties involved in conflict. In October 2018, the first ever Kazakhstan national peacekeeping contingent at the level company with 120 military personnel was deployed to UN mission in Lebanon as part of the Indian battalion. Since that, we already conducted four rotations at company level. In March this year, fifth peacekeeping contingent at level of Tatun was sent to the mission. This platoon is used as rapid reaction force, so our peacekeepers will gain the skills needed for other missions that are more complex. Along the way, peacekeeping contingent, three officers, one of the main headquarters, two in the Italian uh, part of the Italian contingent sector west, are performing their duties. As, uh, as required by UN, Kazakhstan take consistent steps in order to reach gender equality in peacekeeping. Four female officers from Kazakhstan already participated in the UN peace support operations. One of is currently deployed to Western Sahara. The fact that two of them female peacekeepers are currently serving as instructors at peacekeeping training center shows how important the gender mainstream for us. Today's peacekeeping operations require modern and adapted methods and approaches. As identified by our President Tukayev during the comprehensive peacekeeping exercise in October last year, four new most demanding units as part of Smart Village has been declared to the UN peacekeeping potential readiness system. One of the field hospital second level currently undergoing the instruction, uh, introduction to the UN peacekeeping operation training provided by peacekeeping training mobile training team. And the engineer unit, reconnaissance unit, and military police unit also taking language training for future uh, peacekeeping operations. In short term, the main goal is deploy self-sufficient separate unit to UN mission. The other tasks uh, given by President are expanding geography of participation of armed force in peacekeeping operations and also expanding the area of specialization. And this other steps, in order to improve the training system of, of peacekeepers, the peacekeeping training center, center of military medicine and the mining center, as well as Kazakhstan uh, regiment are receiving significant support from government and partner countries. In this regard, uh, military cooperation plays a very important role in, in the UN peacekeeping, especially when it comes to troop providing. There are some bilateral projects on negotiation table. For example, we're right now uh, negotiating uh, the joint deployment of military field hospital, one of the UN missions in Africa. In order to prepare Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan units for their future participation in peacekeeping operation, the variety of exercises in different formats are being held on a regular basis. Since 2003, the Great Britain, among with the United States, have been playing active role in the annual tactical and specialized peacekeeping exercise, Steep Eagle. 
aiming to improve peacekeeping potential of armed forces. The annual peacekeeping exercise Tip Eagle is held in Kazakhstan as well as in territory of partner countries. For example, in 2016, the Tip Eagle exercise was carried out in Great Britain, where 180 military personnel from Kazakhstan have been sent. I must emphasize that contribution of British side to the development of Kazakhstani peacekeeping potential is very significant. For example, within with assistance of great, uh, British side as part of the English for Peacekeepers project, a number of measures to increase language skills of Kazakhstani military personnel is currently being taken. This includes language training for peacekeeping personnel and special, specialized language training for instructors. So, uh, in period from November 2020 and March 2021, Oxford advanced English course for our instructors was conducted. I am also very delighted to inform you that in order to improve quality of, of teaching process in our center, British side has provided us with six mobile training kits, as well as with some supporting equipment and training materials. Not the part of the project, but very really worth to mention that gender and human security advisor course, as well as train the trainer course for Kazakhstani military personnel have been organized by the Office, Office of British Defense Attaché on an annual basis. So, and uh, I would like to also introduce uh, my center, which is directly involved in the training of military police and civilian personnel before their deployment to the UN mission. Peacekeeping Training Center of Minister of Defense, also known as CASEN, is a military individual training establishment that enjoys International Association of Peacekeeping Training Center and Partnership Learning and Training Center community membership. The mission is to conduct, organize, and host specialized peacekeeping and intensive language training for national and foreign military personnel and civil specialized specialists, as well as for international and regional organizations. It was established in June 2006 as PFP Training Center at the Military Institute for Foreign Languages. In April, in order to increase quality and effectiveness of training, the center was expanded and became peacekeeping training center. So the uh, center provided intensive language training for national peacekeeping contingent, also six months language tra training in frame of international military education training program. So existing infrastructure and number of instructors allow us to teach up to the 100 students simultaneously twice a year. We also provide some number of the courses which is certified by United Nations. For example, United Nations Staff Officer course. This year in the May, we, uh, we held international at international level and we had guests from the Great Britain, Spain, Kyrgyzstan and Mozambique. We also planning uh, in the, this November uh, to host United Nations Protectors of Civilian Course. We also have some uh, courses which is uh, essential, must have knowledge uh, before the sending to the, any personnel, military, police, civilian, to any uh, mission, United Nations mission around the world. And for next year, we also decided to conduct four week UN military observer course as pilot one. And they were also working to uh, uh, have course in UN gender policy, which is uh, more demanding today. With expanding geography, our participation in UN mission, the French language training is now also a requirement. So we're also working on the, uh, also with, uh, to have tra French language training. So in conclusion, I would like to note that we'll continue fulfilling our collective aspiration for better and security future. Thank you very much. Colonel, um, thank you very much indeed. That was a, a, a fascinating uh, presentation. And I hope that we can perhaps circulate that document to all 
well, to all the panelists and to all the viewers, because I think they'll find that very useful and helpful. Um, so thank you. We've um, got an enormous number of questions, and, and but on the other hand, time is um, of the essence and time is running out. Um, rather than go through all the questions, I'm going to ask one central question to each of the panelists. And if you could each give me um, a sort of one or two sentence uh, response, and it's really looking at what is your ambition for the cooperation between the UK and Kazakhstan in the military um, sphere? Um, so, Lord Astor, just your comment on that. Um, I, I would like to see as many Kazakhs coming over to Sandhurst, Dartmouth, Cranwell, Royal College of Defence Studies and other uh, training um, venues that we put on. And, and to see more joint training. We heard from Bob about the Operation Step, but more of, more of those. So we see more military cooperation, not just with the Army, but also with the Navy and the Air Force. Excellent, thank you. Um, Alain Idris, self, Your Excellency. I uh, subscribe to what uh, Lord Astor said, and uh, I um, uh, also want to say that uh, these years of independence have... Uh, uh, shown that we have a very uh, remarkable record of our uh, partnership. It focuses on key areas of mutual interest. Uh, first of all, uh, military training, language training, peacekeeping training. There, there are elements of mili military technical uh, cooperation. Uh, Christopher Goodman, uh, one of the attendees, asked uh, whether Kazakh cadets attended uh, Sandhurst uh, uh, Staff College or uh, Royal Defense uh, uh, College. Yes, we did, uh, but uh, since our cooperation is advanced now, uh, we moved to uh, uh, short-term uh, course training uh, practice, uh, and if need be in the future to go into uh, full-time military training, uh, that is also on our agenda, and uh, actually all these facts, aspects are being uh, in detail discussed on a, a, a half-annual basis between the uh, special working group of two defense ministries, who finalize and then sign up uh, the military uh, annual plan and work uh, along this. I saw a question there, Rupert, by the way, uh, whether uh, there is a prospect of uh, military cooperation between the uh, Turkey Council countries. Uh, uh, asked yeah. by some uh, gentleman, his name is Alexei Lukyaninka. Uh, let me, uh, I have to answer this question uh, because uh, unfortunately we live in the world uh, not only of fake news, uh, but also fake perceptions and speculations. Uh, this is as far uh, from reality as uh, a Mars is far from the Earth. Uh, therefore, I would invite Mr. Lukyanka and people like him not to be uh, the victims and subjects of this uh, media brain uh, washing. Uh, this is absolutely unrealistic and uh, uh, will never uh, take shape. And uh, I think that the future of our cooperation is quite bright. As far as there was a question about military technical cooperation, what equipment we buy, uh, usually this is a sensitive part of uh, 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 the information, but I can tell you that we partner, for example, in Afghanistan uh, operation. And when uh, British troops uh, go back, uh, we uh, do have uh, some uh, nice uh, uh, experience. For example, British uh, army has shared with us uh, quad uh, quadricycles, for example, or uh, night vision, uh, infrared instruments, uh, and stuff like that. So this is quite a useful and very uh, mutually beneficial uh, and enriching experience. Alan, thank you very, very much indeed. Um, Colonel uh, Bob Stewart, uh, your ambitions in a few words for the um, bilateral military cooperation. In a few, few words, because I spoke too long earlier, I would like to see Kazakh officers attached to British Army units for a period of one to two years. End of. Thank you. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, let's let's try and make that um, make that happen. Um, Colonel Kasainov, what, what what is your um, view? What what would you like to see in terms of the uh, mutual cooperation between our two countries in the military sphere? Uh, I thought that uh, right honourable Colonel Stewart just has taken it from the tip of my tongue. Uh, my ambition is that we jointly participate, Kazakh Union jointly with uh, British contingent participate in one of the peacekeeping operations. 
uh, preferably probably chapter seven, which will provide us huge experience of doing collaborative work. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and um, panel Nimitalin. So uh, we, are, as a training center, working in the operational level. So, and uh, I just would like to say, during the one year, uh, British Defence Attaché four times visit our center. So we working day by day. So uh, getting uh, numerous support and uh, exchanging experience. And I think it's uh, getting much better, more stronger. So, and uh, there's some question about the uh, general advisory course. So uh, also we're working with, uh, as told the last year, November, we had gender policy course, which provided by British government. So after we learned that uh, gender policy is very important today in the UN missions, so also we decided to kind of develop this course and uh, to have in our basis an early kind of conduct this course. So it is one of the examples which is we're learning from the, each other and uh, getting strong support. Um, well, th thank you very much indeed, Colonel. And we'll, we will um, feed all these ideas in both through the um, Ministry of Defence, but also through the Chief of the General Staff and the Chief of the Defence Staff. So uh, there's been very good points made. I'm sorry that we've run, uh, run out of time. There are many other questions and we will probably have to have a follow up uh, webinar to cover cover all the other um, issues. But look, I'm extremely grateful to uh, Jeff Temple for bringing this important webinar uh, to fruition and organising what is um, a stellar array of speakers. Um, David Skeels, one of our directors, also plays a vital role, um, particularly in our sector specific websites uh, and uh, webinars. And I'd also like to thank Ali Jean, who has Bring, brought this together electronically as our membership secretary. So Alijan, thank you for your help on that. Um, my very special uh, thanks goes to all our distinguished panelists, both from the United Kingdom and Kazakhstan. You provided great insight and you've also answered these questions uh, most candidly. Um, thank you too to all our viewers and to please see our website for future uh, meetings and we welcome all new members and sponsors. Um, so again, thank you very much indeed, Erlan for the embassy and all your help, uh, and all our speakers, Bob, Lord Astor, and our two colonels from Kazakhstan. It's been a tremendous webinar. Very grateful to you all, and thank you. <laughs>